Welcome to IREB Resistance Radio, where we discuss the resistance work going on in Minnesota's 2nd Congressional District. IREB is an indivisible group formed after the 2016 election in opposition to an executive that we feared was going to do grave damage to our country. As our fears have been proven out, so has our membership grown. We attract people from across the political spectrum, but make no mistake, we are united as a progressive force in Minnesota's politics. Join us on our Facebook page, search for The Indivisible Resistance of Egan and Burnsville. Okay, welcome to podcast number 10. Uh, today, we are fortunate to have a very special guest. Uh, we have Dr. Elise Mann. She's running for the Minnesota State House to be representative down in 56... B. A? B. Yeah, A? okay. Yeah, and you're on the other side of John, right? I'm on the other side of Hunter. A Hunter, right. Okay, yeah. And John's no, kind of, well, I, I, I can't keep this straight. And I normally put a map up, but I'm going to let you <laughs> um, tell us what is your area? What, you know, what, what area do you cover? So people listen. So, yeah, so 56B is northern Lakeville and kind of the center of Burnsville. Okay, yeah, and you know we've got a lot of um, overlap with you because we've got a lot of Burnsville members in our group. So um, yeah. Lakeville and Burnsville, now that's got to be an interesting nut to crack. But before I get started interviewing, I, I forgot uh, our our favorite first question on our interview is is to kind of get to know you a little bit better. And we usually yeah. ask our guests, um, you know, what was that thing that made you decide to change what you were doing? and get involved in politics. And I know your story's a little longer, so I'll give you some time to answer that. You know, where Yeah, so a, a lot of things happened for me to make me want to stop being a full-time doctor, and which I haven't actually stopped being yet, um, and I, enjoying politics. Yeah, so um, a couple things. One is, you know, I've been a doctor for 11 years now, um, and over this time, I, I hear the same stories over and over and over again. Um, because I do family practice, and so people kind of tell me their their personal stories as well as their medical issues, and I get to know people very personally, and get to know their families, which is you know the best part about my job. And I keep hearing stories about people can't afford their mortgages, they can't afford their rent, um, they're working full time jobs. I have families who both parents together work over a hundred hours per week, and they can't make ends meet. And so these stories just have been getting worse and worse. And I have people crying in my office on a daily basis because of, of the daily struggle that people go through. So there's that. There's the fact that healthcare, you know, our healthcare system is, is broken. Uh, people don't have access to affordable care. And at some point in our lives, we all use healthcare. So how is it we have something that every single person uses and that we've made it so unaffordable for a very large portion of our population? You know, it makes my job pretty miserable because I can't take care of people the way they should be taken care of. I can't give them the medicines that they need because the medicine prices are too expensive. I can't um, request they have the tests that they should have uh, because they can't afford those tests. So it makes my job pretty miserable. And then I have to spend time on the phone with insurance companies arguing with them saying, no, this person needs this test. You have to cover this. And they can say no, right? So they're dictating what kind of care you, you're getting. And that's not right for someone who you've never met, who isn't a doctor, gets to tell you what you can and can't do as far as your health care goes. So there was that which is a huge part of it. Um, then uh, I do international medicine. I do a lot of international medical mission trips. And my couple of my last ones was, um, I went to Puerto Rico in the wake of Hurricane Maria to provide care. And, you know, there was so much human suffering. Uh, and these are American citizens. And, and they were left to, to get by on their own with minimal help. Um, and I thought that was really devastating what I saw there. And I was very upset. I want to uh, actually interrupt and ask you about yeah. the, the work that you do with them. And I read um, you've been places like Zimbabwe. Um, w w what kind of network are you? Do you just have other doctors that call you up and say, hey, we, we need you. We got to go. Yeah. So sometimes I do. Right. My last trip, I went to the Amazon in Brazil uh, just a couple months ago. And that was uh, I just met one of my patients, actually. She was a vice president of this organization. And she said um, she was telling me about it. And, and I said, oh, I do. I do, you know, international trips. And she says, well, we need a doctor in Brazil 
you know, three months from now, who can speak Portuguese? Do you know someone who can speak Portuguese? And I said, well, I can speak Portuguese. <laughs> and she was like, that's it. You have to come. And so that was one of those crazy, it was meant to be moments uh, in life. Um, the Puerto Rico trip, um, in, um, a friend of a friend knew the organization. They called me, asked me to go. Um, but otherwise, I seek out these opportunities and, and um, you know, they're, they're generally volunteer opportunities. I take some vacation time and I go to these places. Uh, Zimbabwe it, was, go ahead. I was going to ask, is, wasn't Zimbabwe somewhat dangerous? I mean, some of these places and, and the conditions were poor. I mean. Yeah. Um, Zimbabwe was right before things got really bad. And I was there for uh, five months. So it was a little bit longer trip. Um, and I didn't have any kids, so I was willing to take a little bit more risk. <laughs> you know, now my trips are all very much vetted and I know they're safe. And, and so I don't, I don't take unnecessary risk. Well, you're a good mom. I, and, and so <laughs> let, let, let me ask you about that too. So you, you're, you're married and you have three kids, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, and, and you've got a, and you've got an actual, you're, you're, you're still a practicing doctor, a, a family practitioner. Yep. And and you're running for the the state house because you've been called because of these discrepancies in how medical care is being given. You've That's been right. called, and yeah. and this is this, that was your thing then. It was it was because it's you you just met it every day right there right, in your office and and still are. That's uh, that's a great. Uh, story so uh well then talk a little bit more about your personal history you know you're growing up in brazil and and um you know your parents moving here i i read a little bit about that and i found that story very interesting if you could just kind of give yeah. us so um in the 80s brazil was under military um leadership and it wasn't the greatest time so my parents um afraid of what might come decided to move us all to the united states uh, in search of the, that American dream of a better future. And when we got here, we stayed with a family in Richfield, Minnesota. Uh, we stayed with them for about a month and a half before we were able to rent our own place. Um, so they really took us under their wing and, and made us feel welcome, gave us a home in Minnesota. Um, and we are you know, eternally grateful for that family and what they were, what they were able to give us. And so I think Part of politically where I stand these days um, stems from that, right? I think that at some point in your life, we all need help. We all need another human being to give us a hand, to, to lift us up from where we are. And then we can turn around and once we've been lifted, once we're on our two feet, we can turn around and do that for somebody else. I think it's part of the human experience. So when I hear people talk about, do it on your own, you don't need any help, you know, that. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's that's real life. I, I you're an amazing you're an amazing person. I mean, I knew you before. Every time I listen to you talk, I, I get a little bit more misty. Thank I you. Talk about some of the things that you've done, and you know. So your education. So then, where did you go to school as you grew up? You you did you did you attend college here then? No. So I went to Richfield uh, until through high school, and then I moved to New York City for college. I went to NYU. I spent a year in Bemidji also, um, and then I did my medical school in Nashville, Tennessee, and then I did my residency training um, in Wisconsin at one of the Mayo Clinic sites. Um, after I graduated, I moved to North Dakota for a couple of years, and while I was in North Dakota, you know, I started seeing firsthand that discrepancy in care and how, you know, some people had it, many people didn't. And so I decided to go back to school at that time and get a master's in public health. So I was working full time and I went back, I went to Johns Hopkins and got my master's in public health and health policy. Um, and then ended up back in Minnesota. So I've well, been here for like five, five or six years now. That's uh, so, um, you know, I, honestly, I, I've given my opinions about healthcare for a couple of years. You know, I'm a personally, and I, and I, I, don't, I, I don't know how you're going to answer the question. But I'm personally a, a single payer person. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I see us wanting to go forward. And, and so um, I'm going to ask you, you're probably the best trained 
uh, most experienced and bravest doctor I've ever met. So what word, what's, what's good for us? What do we need? Yeah, so I think that we need comprehensive, we need to start working towards comprehensive universal coverage. Without a doubt, right? We are the only industrialized nation in the world without universal coverage. And how we get to universal coverage, there isn't, there isn't one silver bullet to get there. There's many different ways. We can do single payer. We can do multi-tier. There's also insurance mandate, which we kind of tried with Obamacare, but didn't work out very well for several reasons. But um, to me, universal care is the answer. And it is because um, right now, the World Health Organization ranks us about 37th in health outcomes. What those 36 countries that are doing better than us have mostly in common is universal coverage, right? So we have that. Two, we know that our system is not sustainable because we are paying way more than any other country in the world and we're not getting the health return on it. We're not getting those health outcomes. And so universal care is cheaper. Every single country that has it has proven that. And there was a study done for Minnesota in particular in 2012 um, and that study also showed that universal coverage is significantly cheaper per individual and for the state as a whole. So I think that should be our ultimate goal. And I think that we can get there. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, so uh, the numbers that I remember, and, and uh, we, we, in America, we pay about $12,000 per person in this country for health care. The next most expensive country is Japan, which pays about $9,000, and some are, you know, less than half of that, and they're getting yep. better outcomes than we're getting. Exactly. And exactly. so this, this, this whole, like, it doesn't work thing is just, it's just propaganda. And so that kind of reminds me of that horrible uh, campaign ad that they had been running against, too. I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't, I'm not going to ask you to talk about it, but it is just, it is so unfactual. Yeah, so I think one of the other issues I have with politics in general and why I decided to run is that I'm really tired of getting lied to, right? Just like everybody else in this country. The, the negativity and the lies in politics are completely out of control, in my personal opinion. I think that we should have like a panel where if you're a politician and you're saying very false things, if you're, I mean, people uh, outright lie right? Well, they if are we now, catch you, yes. Yeah. If, so I think if we catch you in a lie like three times, you're fired. <laughs> yeah, you're out of here. <laughs> I know something. Well, I, you know, I, I kind of tend so, I, um, you know, I like the idea of like a public finance, you know, campaign where the information, you know, the, is there uh, at a site that you're given, you know, a, a space where you can produce video and, and all the, you know, at, at a high level, but it's there and it's got to be right. It can't, you can't lie about stuff. I mean, you know. Exactly. You know, so we're, we're hearing about healthcare. Everyone is saying, oh, it's going to cost $17 billion out of your pocket. And that's not true, right? So there's, we're gonna need, so this is the study, that's the same study that they're quoting that I just told you about that says Minnesota is gonna save over a billion dollars in a 10 year span. The study says that we're gonna need $17 billion per year to cover our part of this healthcare system. We're currently paying significantly way more than $17 billion. Yes. Uh, so that number is actually much cheaper than we're already paying, but they're using it as a negative thing. So you're, you're getting that number out of context. And again, you're getting it pretty much as a lie. Yeah. You know, they're saying it to scare you. They're saying it in a wrong way. It's not right. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting hopeful that, you know, as their lies, you know, get more like just bald faced, it's probably <laughs> desperation. You know, they, they see this all slipping away from them. And, you know, the polling, you know, seems to be going our way. So we'll see how that, we'll see. How that works out. All right. Um, and then we, 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 so we talked about, you know, a couple of your passions, education and, and, uh, and uh, healthcare, um, you know, at the state level, this is where, you know, you're going to, uh, you're, you're going to step in there. And, and, and right now uh, the, all the reports are, <clears throat> you know, uh, at least with the current power structure, it's not a, uh, an easy place to work. Um, you know, one of the things that they have a lot of issues with, and I, I've heard over and over again, is like these omnibus bills that are uh, going on there. Do you, do you have any, uh, comments about you know this legislature that you want to try to help improve yeah so i you know the omni 
omnibus. I can never say that word. It's unbelievable. <laughs> uh, those bills are just, they're ridiculous, right? How can you expect anyone to read a thousand pages in one day and vote with knowledge on what's in those bills? You know, it's a sneaky, it's underhanded way to govern, to legislate, um, and it should not be allowed. And it isn't, right? Technically, by the Minnesota Constitution, it's not, it's not allowed, mm -hmm. but people still do it anyways. It's not right. Um, the, the legislature was told that if they did that, the governor would veto that bill. They were told that, and yet they did it anyways. So it becomes this great scapegoat of, oh, we tried to do something, but it got vetoed. Well, no, you didn't try, because if you had tried, you would have presented single bills that people would have had a chance to look at, read, and debate about, like a functioning government. Right. Right. So what happened was, um, it it was not right. It was it was it was negligence from 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 the legislature, and it, we should work really hard to prevent that from ever happening again. And I think uh, you're just the person to go step in. We've got some, uh, you know. You, I, from my perspective, I, I, we've got a really good chance, I think, uh, to to turn some of these seats that that you know, um, uh, uh, you know, we've to moving some of the incumbents out and yeah. and and moving towards a more progressive di direction here in CD two. And I and and I think you know, you were, I'm starting to see that. And I was just kind of curious, you know, as you're 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 a hard worker. You I mean, you, you got the practice, you got the kids, you got everything going on, and you're out door knocking. You know, and, and we were talking a little bit earlier, you know, about some of the things that you're hearing at the doors. Is there any other stories you want to relate from your, you know, campaigning that, that Well, so I went door knocking today for a few hours and it apparently was winter today. I don't know what happened. <laughs> no, it got cold. It was cold. Today. <laughs> so I went out in my fall gear and turned out it was winter. So I had to run back home and put my winter gear on. Um, but I will say that the colder it gets, the nicer people get, right? Oh. People were letting me in to warm up. Uh, it was actually, even people who disagree with me politically still let me come into their house so I could warm up, oh, which funny. I thought was amazing. Um, and it gives me hope that with strong leadership, with, with open, honest leadership that trickles down into our communities, that we build cooperation, we build trust. And it gives me hope that our communities are going to stop being so divided, you know, and that we can come back together as communities and, and move this state forward. So it was nice. Well, that's pretty awesome. Okay. So we're going to, we're getting close to the end here and then uh, we're going to try something new. Um, uh, uh, we we're going to ask, you know, just a little bit of an offbeat question. And it's all to, because you're the first person, I'm going to give you a choice between two things. And so you can okay. tell me which one you want to answer. Um, the first question is, what is the most humorous thing that has happened to you recently? And, you know, just that, that, that can be pretty wide open. And okay. the uh, question two would be the best thing about the last job that you had, what that would have caused you to stay if money were no object. Well, I think the, the humorous things that happen to me <laughs> are typically wildly inappropriate. So <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, we don't want to. We don't want to answer it that it. one. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think honestly, any job that I have, the most fantastic thing about my job are the relationships that I build with people over time. You know, um, people come to their doctor and they they open up. They tell me things that they don't tell other people. Um, and so that's really special to me, and that's really important. And if I could keep the same patients forever and bring them with me everywhere I moved, I would do that. Um, unfortunately, I do have to move every now and then, you know, so, so that's, so that's what would keep me at every single job are, are my patients. Well, that's a, that's a very nice thing to say. Well, hopefully you're not going to have to move anytime soon. Maybe we can uh, get you a few terms in the state house. We'll see. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Elise Mann for visiting with us today. And, uh, um, that does it for our podcast number. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, all right. Take care. Come back again soon. Thank you very much for coming on.